Hello and welcome to another Top Grades Made Easy video. We're going to show you how we arrive at our predictions for the Jekyll and Hyde question for AQA. With me, as you can see, is Barbara from First Rate Tutors. And Barbara, take us through from 2017. Okay, so when it comes to Jekyll and Hyde, of course, we want to first look at patterns. In the 2017 exam, students were presented with an extract from chapter six, which is the incident at the window where you've got Jekyll, he's withdrawn from society, and then Utterson and Enfield spot him, and Utterson within this particular extract is inviting him to leave to just, you know, go and get a bit of fresh air, right? So that's the incident at the window, and this is before they see Jekyll starting to transform. And the question asks how the presentation of Dr. Jekyll allows us to feel sympathy for him as a uh, as readers. Okay, so it was a statement question. In fact, it's the only statement question within the past paper exams. And we're asked, you know, the way Dr. Jekyll is presented, to what extent do we as readers feel sympathy for him? I would argue when thinking about this extract and also thinking about, you know, the novella as a whole, definitely uh, agree with the notion that we as readers are meant to feel sympathy and empathy for Dr. Jekyll. Remember that this novel and the crux of this entire story is this inability that Dr. Jekyll has to reconcile his evil and his good, his slightly more immoral side and his moral side, and he tries to separate it. And really, this is a message to readers because we all have that duality and that side of us that exists, right? And so the tragedy is this notion that Dr. Jekyll refuses to accept it, okay? And I think for this question, when you're talking about how we feel sympathy for Dr. Jekyll, of course, you're starting off with the internet in the window where we can see that he's very withdrawn from society. And then you say that actually he seems like quite a sympathetic figure. And also there seems to be this element of mystery. But equally, you want to talk about Henry Jekyll's statement of the case, chapter 10. This is when he confesses that he was unable to reconcile this dark side to him. But if you wanted to maybe also present a counter argument to what extent we don't feel sympathy for him, you can also talk about um, chapter three, when we first meet Dr. Jekyll and he seems very um, reluctant to share details about Mr. Hyde. He also seems like this individual who um, really tries and maintains this veneer and ap appearance of respectability. So I, I love this question because uh, any question where you can get completely opposite views is one that it, students are going to find easy to get top marks in. And so I would be arguing that he doesn't expect his readers to sympathise with Jekyll at all uh, because Jekyll behaves in so many unchristian ways and he gets the Christian punishment of being killed at the end of the novel. And so, you know, the bad guy like Hyde, like Jekyll, they get killed off. And that is kind of divine punishment for everything that he's done. So, question number two from 2018. We had to look at chapter four the murder of Carew, and that is the most important event in the novel, so a super exciting one to get. And you had to ask, how did Stevenson create mystery and tension? This is an absolute gift, because there are loads of mysteries with this killing. For example, Hyde has just been wandering around London. What is it about Carew that makes him choose Carew as his victim? We're never ever told. In his confession, uh, Jekyll says, well, I just had all this rage inside me and I just let it out, which is just Jekyll's way of not actually telling the truth. He's n deliberately not revealing to us why he's killed Carew. And then we've got this other tantalising detail that Carew had a letter addressed to Gabriel Utterson. Uh, so that is an absolutely bizarre coincidence and it has to have something to do with the murder. I'm not going to tell you all my theories around that, but that's the central mystery of the plot. Why on earth does Jekyll kill Carew? And then why does he kill nobody else? Sorry, not Jekyll, Hyde. Why does Hyde do it? Uh, the reason I said Jekyll wasn't just because I'm stupid. <laughs> it's because Hyde is described as Jekyll's bravo. In other words, Hyde only does what Jekyll wants to do, which brings us back to why would Jekyll want to kill Carew? And I'm not going to tell you in this video. <laughs> okay, so the following year, 
we had in 2019 an extract from chapter 8 which is the last night okay this is the point at which Paul realizes something is terribly wrong and so he goes to find uh, Utterson in order that, uh, so that they can plot on how they can break into Dr. Jekyll's lab okay now in this extract, the question that uh, students were asked for this particular exam was how Stevenson creates or even uh, presents Mr. Hyde as inhuman and disturbing member of society. So how is Hyde presented and depicted as an inhuman and disturbing member of society? This question is great and I personally see it as a bit of a gift, okay? Because when I think about some of the Jekyll, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde past paper questions, they tend to be quite challenging. I think when it comes to Mr. Hyde's character, he definitely, especially when you think about the keywords in this question, inhuman and disturbing member of society, he definitely uh, is presented as inhuman. He's ape-like, he's short, and Hyde is used as a character, as this really interesting Darwinian character that inspires a lot of fear within uh, Stevenson's Victorian readers, okay? And of course, also his behavior, his very kind of psychotic behavior also makes him a very deeply disturbing character and this is the genius of the novel because we find that that inhumanity and that disturbing aspect of Mr Hyde's character resides in somebody as respected and as uh, you know amazing as Dr Jekyll because what Stevenson is trying to show is that we have this duality within all of us. Yeah that links brilliantly to this problem that Christian readers had with Darwin's theory of evolution. And what we kind of forget now, but the Victorians didn't forget, is Darwin didn't predict that we would keep evolving into better and better forms of ourselves. What he said is, you'll keep evolving to be something that's better and better at surviving. And the problem we have with Hyde is he's better and better at surviving because he's evil. And actually, we might evolve to become more evil instead of less evil, which would have alarmed Christian readers. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I love that because it will fit every question. Tell me where we are, Barbara. We are in 2020. 2020, <laughs> thank God for that. So we're on chapter 10, Henry Jekyll's Confession and Ideas About Good and Evil. This is an absolute gift of a question because good and evil is... Jekyll and Hyde, it's the duality because Jekyll contains both good and evil and he represents all of us and so everything about the novel is wrapped up in that one question. It's impossible to do badly in that. Barbara's already said that these questions are really difficult and they are because they're always about the author's ideas but the good news is when you write about the author's ideas you always get into the top of the mark scheme. So this is absolutely brilliant uh, I think that Stevenson has some really interesting perspectives about good and evil because he was devoutly Christian until he went to university and then he rejected all forms of Christianity and so he doesn't see good and evil the way that all his readers do and this creates great tension in the book and also in Stevenson's mind what is truly good and what is truly evil. Um, so if you delve into that the Christian message, but also how would someone who's not Christian view it? You're going to easily get grades eight and nine. Okay, now in the following year, 2021, uh, there was yet another part of chapter eight. Okay, so chapter eight, the incident of the last night, which was also tested in 2019. This is where Paul was like, oh, something really horribly wrong is going on. I need to find Utterson. Okay, so you get yet another part of that chapter presented and obviously students have to answer the question relating to how settings are used to create disturbing and threatening atmospheres. I honestly feel that this was the hardest question yeah. of the different yeah. questions so I feel you know my heart really goes out to students who had to answer that particular Jekyll and Hyde question. However I think what's really interesting for this question when you're considering how setting is used okay you are being invited to consider for instance how pathetic fallacy is used to create this atmosphere of mystery and tension, how setting is used to even reflect the characters themselves. Even think about Dr. Jekyll's own house, right? It reflects that duality. There's two sides of him, right? There's one side of it, which is like very beautiful. It's the um, it's in central London, the really nice part of central London. And then you've got the other darker side of the house, which is in Soho, which at the time was seen as really disreputable. Now, when you're thinking about this question and in terms of how the laboratory, right, which is what Paul and Utterson are plotting into breaking into, the setting is used 
to highlight and to kind of uh, Stevenson's way of playing on Victorian fears about science, right? Something terrible must be going on within Dr. Jekyll's lab with this individual, Mr. Hyde, okay? So I think this question was is interesting in the sense that you're asked to now consider how settings are being used, but of course you still want to link it to how these settings reflect characters, okay? Yeah, I absolutely love that question because it's so difficult. Because if you know just something about the context, it's easy to get the top grades. So Hyde's um, flat is in Soho and Jekyll's house is in Leicester Square. And you can actually look at that on Google Maps and see what that means. It means that the corrupt part of London, Soho, is literally 200 metres away from the really affluent part, the respectable part that Jekyll lives in. And what Hyde is saying is there's actually really no difference between the respectable man and the sinful man. And actually they're even choosing the same parts of London to live in so that the rich can indulge in their sinful pleasures mm. just in Soho without anybody knowing. Uh, so that's just an absolutely easy way to use the setting to talk about the themes of the novel. Uh, right, we come to 2022, chapter six, and this is Dr. Lanyon, when we find out why Dr. Lanyon decides to die, because he's seen the transformation of Hyde into Jekyll. And the question was, how Jekyll is mysterious? Now, you can answer that in so many brilliant ways, but the wonderful mystery is, why does Lanyon decide to kill himself, or to choose to die, once he's seen the transformation of Hyde into Jekyll. And does Jekyll plan that? In other words, is Jekyll's motive to kill Dr. Lanyon? Oh. Yeah, which <laughs> I really like as the interpretation. You don't have to agree with that. You can no, you can totally deny it. But the mystery of Jekyll uh, is just a wonderful one to write about. Okay, and now... Last year's exam, the 2023 paper, presented students with actually a really nice extract taken from chapter one, the story of the door when Enfield is walking on a um, dark morning at three o'clock at the end of the world, right? And the question is asking how Mr. Hyde is presented as a threatening and dangerous character, which in all honesty is kind of a slightly different way of asking the 2019 question, right? How Stevenson presents Hyde as inhumane and disturbing as a member of society. Now, with this question, you're just basically making the same points as the previous Mr. Hyde question. And indeed, any Hyde question, you are thinking about how he's presented as this very disturbing figure. He is used as, so Stevenson, again, uses him to play up to Victorian fears. His presentation of ape-like, he plays up to this theory of evolution, right? The idea that we all evolve from apes, therefore we have an animalistic side to us. Um, Mr. Hyde's actions seem to be very interesting and predatory, right? And especially when you're thinking about uh, his murder of Sir Denver, Denver's Peru. Obviously, I have a slightly different theory when it comes to why he might have killed him. Remember, he's being presented as this Darwinian figure. And what happens in the world of Charles Darwin when he's looking at the survival of the fittest, you always have the predator and the prey. And the predator always picks on the weakest prey rather than picking somebody that picking on somebody that own size right so when you're considering uh, mr hyde's character and when you're talking about him and how he's presented as very threatening and dangerous there's also this very disturbing animalistic element towards him that he's presented and of course also he's depicted as also this very sacrilegious figure so when it comes to a Hyde discussion, of course, always tie it back to the idea and the irony that this is the same person as Dr. Jekyll, who's supposedly very moral, very Christian and so on, right? And Stevenson is do doing that to draw on the contradictions of human nature. So I think a Hyde or Jekyll question is great because you can, you can basically make the same ideas and the same discussions, but from different angles, depending on the question. Brilliant. Which brings us to our predictions. Uh, so I'm going to predict a theme question because we've had a few character questions on the trot and then we've had a discussion about which theme it would be and I've chosen evil not because it's definitely one that's going to come up it has come up before the idea of good and evil was here but also because the idea of evil allows you to discuss Jekyll and Hyde so if either of those characters come up and you prepared evil it will fit perfectly and then it also allows you to write about Stevenson's actual views about society and what really is evil and what isn't 
to contrast it to the Christian perspective that his readers would have had about what is evil and what is good. So it's super versatile. It's the central theme that underpins everything else. That's why I'm picking it. Okay. What are you? I personally feel like a theme question will come up because, as Mr. Sellers has mentioned, we've got Jekyll and Hyde that came up for the last two years. And the theme that I think will come up, and it's one of my favourite themes, in fact, to be honest, uh, I was saying that Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is one of my favourite texts to teach. My favourite theme is the theme of duality. I think that there's a strong possibility of that coming up. Number one, it's never come up as a theme question. But also, I think with this question, it's, uh, you know, again, one of the key messages and, you know, one of the key themes that's explored in lots of detail, right? Through Dr. Jekyll's character and Mr. Hyde, but also through some of the other characters. What was Enfield doing in the end of the world at three o'clock in the morning? He was indulging in his darker desires, right? So he also has a dual nature within him, right? Which he hides very nicely in order to protect his reputation and maintain that aura of secrecy. Lots of the Victorian gentlemen within this novella have this dual nature. Just the most obvious one and the most obvious victim is, of course, Dr. Jekyll. So, of course, if a duality question were to come up, it can really be any number of extracts, right? So, of course, Dr. Uh, Jekyll's own confession. You also have uh, chapter one. I don't think that's going to come up because that also came up uh, just uh, last year. So I don't think that will come up. But also duality can be presented with any of the Hyde extracts, right? Remember that Stevenson is always trying to convey this idea that one of the tragedies of Jekyll and Hyde is this inability of Dr. Jekyll to accept this dual nature that resides within him, okay? Remember that at the time, Victorians were deeply religious and there was this prevailing Christian view that it was possible if, you know, you prayed enough and you were very religious to be completely good and to completely rid yourself of evil. However, Stevenson is showing, no, this is not possible. So, of course, in your discussion, you want to mention that and to bring that out in your analysis. Brilliant. Uh, is duality the same as a good and evil question, do you reckon? I think uh, it could potentially be the same as good and evil because we have good and evil residing within us. That's what results in our dual nature. But also duality, uh, to, without being too complex, is equally a psychological question, okay? So I usually tend to talk about this with maybe kind of my very advanced students. Another sub idea that's explored, right? Remember that this is written during the Victorian era, a time of science and exploration. There was a school of psychology that was evolving. And there was a guy called Sigmund Freud who believed that the human mind was like um, the tip of an iceberg. And we have this good side that we present to the world, which is just a tiny little tip within the iceberg. But then we have this animalistic side of us that resides also within us, right? So when I'm thinking about the idea of duality, when you're discussing the idea of duality, you can mention duality is just purely the good and evil that resides within us, but also a slightly deeper analysis, and this is what we call a more psychoanalytical or psychological interpretation, is Stevenson is illustrating that within all of us, we have this, um, you know, this tiny part of us that we want to present to the world. We are moral, we're good people, but there's this very animalistic nature that resides within all of us, okay? So that's also the other element of duality that we'll think about. So you talk about the ego and the id. You, there we the go, top. yes. So and you've got. Have the... you made that video yet, Barbara? I have not. <laughs> She's going to make that video. I will make a new video on that, okay? For those of you that don't yeah. jump on hide, okay? Fantastic. If you would love another prediction video, prediction video even, and why wouldn't you? You're going to jump over to Barbara's channel where they're going to find which one? It is the Inspector Calls prediction videos, okay? So make sure you head over for Inspector Calls slash Macbeth. Awesome. All right. Thank you guys for listening.